Once a human rights icon, she now stands accused of complicity in unspeakable atrocities. Myanmar's leader rebuts charges of genocide against the Rohingya. I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is Aung San Suu Kyi's testimony at The Hague. Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi once spoke of the importance of providing sanctuary to the dispossessed. In her Nobel lecture, she said, Our aim should be to create a world free from the displaced, the homeless and hopeless. Fast forward just seven years and the lady, as she is known, stands before the International Court of Justice for ignoring those same words when it comes to Myanmar's Rohingya Muslim minority. She is denied any culpability for what the UN has dubbed a textbook case of genocide. And she is now defending the same military generals who for decades imprisoned and tried to silence her. Natalie Perhernan reports. Myanmar's Aung San Suu Kyi is no stranger to the world stage. She's been there as a Nobel Peace Prize recipient and a human rights icon. Now she's defending her country against accusations of genocide at the International Court of Justice. The Gambia alleges Myanmar is committing genocide against its Rohingya Muslim minority. It's presented harrowing accounts taken from UN reports of mass murder and rape carried out by the Myanmar military in an army crackdown that started in 2016. It's asking the court to approve temporary orders to protect the Rohingya still inside Myanmar. Every day of inaction means that more people are being killed, more women are being ravaged, and more children are being burnt alive. For what crime? Only because they were born different. Born of a different race and to a different religion from those who kill and rape them. Suu Kyi was calm and unwavering in presenting her version of the facts. She argued that the military was dealing with an internal armed conflict started by Rohingya militants that tragically led to the exodus of Muslims from Rakhine State. She said if human rights law was violated, it wasn't genocide. Please bear in mind this complex situation and the challenge to sovereignty and security in our country when you are assessing the intent of those who attempted to deal with the rebellion. Surely, under the circumstances, genocidal intent cannot be the only hypothesis. She didn't directly address the claims of targeted mass murder or sexual violence, but said she couldn't rule out that disproportionate force was used by members of the military. She says Myanmar's military justice system is capable of investigating and prosecuting its own. Her words rung hollow at the refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. In 2017, the Rohingya fled en masse here to safety. No one wants to return. The power of their testimony of what happened in Rakhine State led to this international hearing. If it wasn't genocide or the Rohingya, then what were the killings or burnings? The military cordoned off people and killed them by opening fire, setting them ablaze. Isn't this genocide? Will this be justified if Suu Kyi says so? The whole world will not accept that. The whole world has seen the level of torture on us. It is still going on. Well, joining me now from outside the court is Ronai San Nguyen. He's the coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition. Nai, good to have you back with us on the Newsmakers. Aung San Suu Kyi has made her case. She's presented her argument. Does any of it convince you? No, not at all. And she, it will be recorded in the history, in the world history, that she is the first Nobel Peace Laureate deny and dismiss the genocide. She is uh, defending the uh, criminal who have committed the uh, crime of genocide against the Rohingya for more than four decades in Myanmar. Do you believe that she really believes this or she's just saying it for survival within the system in Myanmar? 
No, not really. Uh, many people, especially diplomatic community, uh, sa uh, said she was not well informed. But on Tuesday, she 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 had the chance to listen the full present full three hour presentation made by the Gambia Consul team at the court. So. Uh, I thought, you know, she would change her mind, uh, but on Wednesday, she was just, uh, you know, uh, uh, reading the statement like it was written by the military, and she, being she's, she, she's a woman, she didn't even mention a word about the Rohingya women and the girl who were gang raped by the Burmese military. And, you know, she, she was just saying, like, this is the complex situation. It is not the complex situation. We have been facing this genocide for more than four decades, since 1978. There were the operation, uh, like the same operation they have done in 1978, in 1991, and also in 2012 and the 2016. So these are the, you know, they have the intention of, uh, intention to, uh, to, to, to wipe out the entire community to destroy the entire community since 1978. It is clear that they have the genocidal intent and genocidal policy because in within Rakhine State there are many other ethnic minority. Uh, they are the Buddhists, but they are only targeting us. You know, even our people they cannot just go out from their house. While even if they are living inside the house, you know, they are harassed, tortured by the police and the military. So it is clear, you know. And also the crime they have committed in, in 1978, 1991, 2012, and 2016 and 2017, mass killing. You know, the, the people were burned alive. Even the small baby were thrown into the fire. Many hundred of women and the girl were as young as even nine years old was gun raped by the Burmese military. So these are the, they have done with the genocidal intent. Whatever they have, uh, she has done, she has said it's just, just denied you know we can call her a genocide denier officially okay Ronai Sanwin it's been a pleasure having you on the newsmakers once again I thank you very much looking forward to chatting to you very soon let's broaden out the discussion now we're joined now from, from London by Mang Zani he's the co-author of the book essays on Myanmar's genocide and he's also with the Free Rohingya Coalition in Yangon, we have Andrew Ngun Kun Lian, a former legal counsel for the Myanmar Peace Center and the Rakhine State Inquiry Commission. And in Budapest is George Shamweli, a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Good to have you all join the discussion. Andrew, let me start with you. We have Aung San Suu Kyi make her argument. Were you proud of her argument? Did you support her argument? I am not support uh, her argument or deny her argument, but uh, the Gambia failed to prove uh, beyond reasonable doubt about the intention to commit uh, genocide by Myanmar government. That's my legal uh, mm -hmm. uh, analysis and my standpoint. Okay, there are many hundreds of levels from zero to genocide. Would you say that along that path towards genocide, there were very many terrible things that happened to the Rohingya people? Um, I was uh, appointed by the President uh, Uteng Seng uh, uh, as a, a commissioner for Rakhine Query Commission, and I spent seven months, seven months uh, uh, in Rakhine State, uh, twice. And I, uh, I can tell you that, you know, what the outside people Outsiders are saying is uh, uh, not uh, reliable and not uh, Okay, reasonable. so let me put it to you this way. Let me put it to you this way, Andrew, right? So, okay, so you're saying that there's no genocidal intent, but that doesn't mean that there weren't massacres or weren't terrible things that happened. Do you accept that the military in Myanmar did terrible things to the Rohingya people, that they massacred, that they raped, that they burnt homes, that they ethnically cleansed? No. Okay. Mang Zani. Come in. Are you surprised by Andrew's claims? Not at all. I expected uh, nothing less than uh, this sort of, uh, you know, a unofficial apology or defense and denial from a legal uh, 
staff member or Rakhine Commission inquiry, uh, you know, set up by President Thainsay. Just to remind you, President Thainsay was one of the military generals under whose leadership uh, and under whose watch the uh, the <coughs> the early 2012 bouts of organized violence against Rohingya took place. Secondly, I think you know although he is a legal scholar, Andrew completely failed to understand that at this very initial stage, the Gambia team is not required to establish the genocidal intent beyond reasonable so doubt. So at this stage, they're just this presenting is, the facts, no, are they? No, no, they are presenting, mm -hmm. they are establishing what is called plausibility of genocidal intent. They have done a brilliant job today, if you watch it, Paul Richler, the lead counsel for the Gambia team, rebutted Myanmar's, you know, unbelievable denial, okay. blow by blow. Okay. I want to bring in George Samueli for a slightly different perspective here. Just big picture, George. Do you trust the legitimacy of this court? Well, I trust the legitimacy of the court. I don't trust... Um, uh, parties that uh, seek to get uh, genocide rulings. I mean, the Genocide Convention was adopted by the United Nations um, after uh, a lot of debate. Uh, countries didn't just sign on to it and think, oh, this is nice, you know, we must stop genocide. There was a, there was a considerable amount of debate. And it's very clear what um, Article 2 of the Genocide Convention says. All of these atrocities can, can be dubbed genocide if they are perpetrated with genocidal intent. And that means exactly what it says. No other plausible motive mm. but genocidal intent is possible. That the, the only possible inference is that these acts were committed with genocidal intent. Now, the, the ICJ has made a number of rulings on this issue. I mean, there was the case of Bosnia brought against uh, Serbia. There was the case of Croatia brought against Serbia. And the ICJ was very explicit. Each time, it rejected the genocide finding because it said, yeah, you can list any number of atrocities, uh, deportation, ethnic cleansing, um, uh, rape, uh, whatever. But unless you can establish that these acts were perpetrated with a view to the physical destruction of a national or ethnic group, then it falls short so of you, genocide. But do you believe that they're no, going no, to hey, find hey, it on, hard to in, meet? Me... Hold on one second, one second, uh, Zani. Yeah. Uh, George, do you, do you believe that they're going to find it hard to establish or meet the criteria of the 1948 Genocide Convention? Yes, I think so. Okay. I think this case okay. will not... Yeah, okay, I, okay. Yeah, it'll Zani? go against the, okay. the Gambia. Yeah, let me come in. You know what? I studied for eight years under the... Um, American investigator of SS officers who served at the uh, Nuremberg Tribunal, uh, yeah, by the name of Robert Kale. And I studied this Rohingya genocide for the last 10 years. And, and I came from an extended military family whose member included deputy commander of all Rakhine Command in 1961. And I worked with three Burmese military intelligence services he uh, chiefs when I was uh, trying to lift the sanctions against my country. But through my 10 years of research, you know, I have found that more than overwhelming evidence to establish genocidal intent that began in 1966. This is what happened. Since 1966, Myanmar or the Burmese military and the state of Myanmar uh, as a whole has institutionalized policies that are designed to demographically re-engineer the northern Rakhine state from predominantly historically Muslim to a Buddhist uh, state. And I think like, you know, when you say there are no physical evidence, well, 39,000 physical structures in 392 villages systematically destroy, wiped out over four decades, four different waves of 
genocidal purges right. have been taking yes, place. Yes, Zani, and, and this is so, you know, and, and and this is part of uh, part of the story here, right? Because you have a a counter history that was provided by Aung San Suu Kyi. It might not be accurate history, but she brings a narrative and says the situation is complex. Andrew, I want to look at this from a, a different angle now as to how seriously Myanmar takes atrocities that they accept by their own army against the Rohingya. I want to point you to a tweet by Sean, uh, Sean Gleason, the, the journalist, who said that Aung San Suu Kyi is saying that legal proceedings in Myanmar need to run their course. The soldiers who murdered 10 unarmed Rohingya civilians in Indin spent half as much time in jail as the Reuters reporters who exposed the massacre. So they were given a certain amount of time and then they were pardoned, right? So with that in mind, Andrew, who's Myanmar trying to kid here? They don't even take it seriously. They say we're punishing people who commit atrocities, but you give them less time than Reuters journalists who talk about it. All right. Uh, first of all, I would like to respond to uh, Dr. Zani. Okay, how about, friend, if you my, don't mind, and, okay. Andrew, if you answer the question first and then respond to Dr. Zani, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, okay, let me respond this one. Okay, uh, killing 10 people. This is, uh, uh, if you try to tame or name as a, this is a genocide, okay, go for another country. Every country. How about we you, talk you about Myanmar? Let's let's focus on Myanmar. We have yeah. this is a daily uh, show. Every day we talk about a different country. Today we're talking about Myanmar. So let's keep uh, yeah. our laser focus on Myanmar. Thank you. Yeah, this is not the uh, uh, intent to kill the people. Okay, uh, this is uh, 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 the fighting that going yes, on. But she's so saying, she trust us people. to weed out our rotten apples. We're providing the example that the rotten apples that Myanmar accepts get less than a year in jail, less than the journalists who talk about the rotten apples. All right. Separate about military justice, uh, national uh, justice and international justice issue. This is nothing to do with uh, ICJ case. This is uh, uh, the things of what happened in Myanmar. So why are you yes, trying she, to... Yes, because uh, she brought it up in her speech. Because she brought it up in her speech. She said... We identify the people who commit atrocities because she did say she acknowledged that disproportionate force was used, but that they yes. did not distinguish clearly yes. enough between ARSA fighters and civilians. I mean, what's interesting is that Aung San Suu Kyi seems to be taking this more seriously than you are because you say all the reports are fake. Nope, I'm not saying that. Uh, she is not uh, uh, coming from a legal uh, background and she doesn't have a legal education. So she might say something or the other thing. Okay, so she's not uh, as qualified as you are to answer this. I okay, address I'm Zani. Not, address Zani. Okay. Let me, say, let me uh, say Zani. Dr. Zani, uh, we left Myanmar in uh, 1980 something. All right, I came back here in 2012. Then I served seven months in Rakhine Gomeshi. I spend most of my time living in Myanmar and doing what real things are going on. You have been living, living in outside and saying and digging out all these uh, uh, Facebook and stupid information and uh, formulating and writing it. You're talking about Facebook being stupid. Very, Andrew, uh, Andrew, Facebook is one of the reasons why Rohingya were killed. It's been proven that a lot of the fake news about the Rohingya yeah. led to them being killed on Facebook. Wasn't so stupid then in Myanmar, that, was it? Yeah, that's uh, the other thing, right? The other day, Gambia, you know, posted the Facebook information. What the uh, post about fake rape or rape, fake or whatsoever things. Okay. Yeah, this okay. is an okay. inadmissible case. Oh. Why are we talking about Okay, so Zani, you're on the outside. You're not on the ground. You don't understand anything. Respond to that. Well, UN fact-finding mission member has never set their foot on the ground. And, uh, you know, many genocide scholars, uh, the reporters have never sat, you know, on the crime scene except in a, a tightly controlled government, uh, uh, you know, the, the journalist tours. And I have spent 10 years, you know, combing through every single document written in Burmese and English language. I have interviewed, you know, scores of rape victims you know, multiple times. I have seen 
children, Rohingya boys and girls with bullet wounds, stories to tell in Cox's Bazaar across the street, yeah? And the commission that Andrew served was headed by my history tutor by the main name of Dr. Miao Mian. The secretary was a young, uh, uh, you know, uh, a former young friend uh, uh, named Choi Yin Line, who I looked up, look after when he first arrived at Cornell at, in the United States. Would you dismiss the fact-finding mission's 444 pages? Uh, having based on satellite imageries, uh, you know, interviews with about 700 genocide survivors across the street, because none of the um, uh, fact find finders, three legal scholars from Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and, and uh, Australia, speaks a language, never lived in the country. I came from the military. I lived in Burma un uh, for 25 years. And I work with the military, uh, you know, to, to try to Zani, end right. the isolation. Right. So I think that this dismissal right. of uh, Zani, me being outside has I think no that's a, credibility. That's a, that's a pretty strong rebuttal that you didn't just get your news from, from Facebook. I want to wrap us up with George Samueli because, George, I want to look at it cynically. The system seems to be rigged here. What can the ICJ actually do? Okay, so say if the judges say yes, Gambia's claim is right. There was genocidal intent. What happens then? It gets bumped up to the UN Security Council. We know that, for example, it's most likely that China will block any action that, that might be taken against Myanmar. So where does this go, George? Well, okay. well I think China would certainly block any um, military action. Uh, China would certainly block any um, sanctions on the part of the UN Security Council. But the United States and the European Union would uh, impose sanctions on uh, Myanmar, and those can be very painful. I mean, we've, we have uh, the experience of uh, Iran, we have the experience of Iraq to go by, uh, and uh, when, when you impose those kinds of sanctions, uh, they cause enormous amount of suffering um, for those people. So um, a, 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 an adverse ruling for, for Myanmar would have quite dire consequences. Uh, there won't be military action taken, but uh, sanctions uh, are, are very, very painful. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate you all joining us here on the Newsmakers. Good to get all your perspectives on this. Thank you very much for joining us. Now questions are being asked about another genocide in another part of the world. But this time, they're being raised in the court of public opinion. Austrian novelist Peter Hanke was awarded this year's Nobel Prize in Literature. He's been called everything from a genius to a genocide denier for denying atrocities carried out by Serbian forces against the Bosniak population during the 1990s Yugoslav War. And now, five years after Hanke called him, himself called the Nobel Prize a false canonization of literature and said it should be abolished, many think he might have been right. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from London by Nevin Angelic. He's a reader in international relations and human rights at Regents University. Good to have you uh, on the program. I mean, it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming really clear that the Nobel Prize is definitely not a sainthood. But, you know, thinking about this academically aside, put, this, put that aside, emotionally, how much of a stab in the heart of the Bosniak people especially was it that he was handed the prize? I think uh, they felt really hard uh, 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 about uh, uh, about this about uh, this award. This is not the first time. Uh, uh, let me remind you that uh, uh, another great writer, dramatist Harold Pinter, was awarded the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, I love Pinter's plays. Uh, I would always go to theater uh, to follow this. But uh, yet again, he was on a similar side as Hanke during the series of post-Yugoslav wars, and mm. especially during the war uh, in Bosnia. Had Govina. Uh, Hanke uh, basically stood on the side uh, that uh, he might have seen as uh, anti-American, anti-Western. He might be very critical of uh, some of the values that are uh, to be found uh, across uh, the developed countries of the Western world. However, uh, uh, for me, this is, this is a, the disappointment was and still is uh, uh, that uh, uh, such a writer, if he is so talented and a great writer, and uh, uh, some of uh, his works uh, ended up 
uh, in uh, theaters and, and in cinema, uh, that he didn't see what was going on, uh, uh, to stand up to the uh, uh, objective points of view and, and uh, uh, to just deny what was so obvious, uh, uh, it was uh, really shocking. This is why I right. feel hard. And also, uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, no, so for those who say, no, we should just value his work based on its merits as literature, the literature being literature, and forget his politics. Your response is what? Uh, well, uh, we have uh, Kevin Spacey, a great actor who just disappeared from uh, uh, movie screens. Uh, uh, Roman Polanski is still around. Uh, there was a huge list of people from film industry that supported him, yet he admitted that he actually had sexual relationship with an underage girl. Uh, so something that is completely morally and legally unacceptable. Uh, uh, we have plenty of this kind of stuff, but this is not kind of controversy like uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, his right wing political views might be controversial, but this is not supporting uh, some uh, war criminal or, or uh, right. supporting crimes committed uh, against uh, humanity. This yeah, and is he really was, the problem yeah, that I yeah. see. He was really flippant when people asked him about it. They, you know, he said, I, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, this word live on TV, but you know, he said this is a calligraphy of SHIT when people asked him about his, his denial of genocide in mm -hmm. Srebrenica and so on. Uh, I wonder, in, in a roundabout way, because the Nobel Committee gave him this prize and then there was the backlash and now we've seen, especially on social media, we had Christian Amanpour and other journalists who covered the war saying, hold on, this is wrong and we're gonna show you the Serb atrocities that we covered from the Balkans wars. He's completely wrong when it comes to his Milosevic uh, support and his denial of that genocide. So in a way, especially for a young generation, people are now uh, becoming aware of what happened. Maybe in a roundabout way, this might be a good thing. What do you think? Uh, all right, to, to remind uh, new generations, you rightly pointed out, uh, this might uh, kind of lead to some kind of, uh, uh, I would call it collateral damage that will be actually uh, collateral positive size. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, generally, I mean, uh, he uh, felt the need, he felt, I know, uh, he admired Sloboda Miloša, he felt the need to go uh, and deliver the speech at his funeral. Salman Rushdie uh, named him as a runner-up in the Moron of the Year competition that year. Uh, uh, the, these are the problems yes. that I really have. And uh, uh, to have uh, but also, it's more universal. Nobel Prize Committee uh, committed huge mistake. Uh, uh, but also, for example, Bosniak communities especially affected uh, because it hurts them of course. more than anyone it's, else. It's a great, uh, yes, but, so, yes. Nevin, uh, Nevin, I've got a yes. wrap. I, I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. but I'm looking forward to having you back on the program soon. I thank you very much for joining us here on The Newsmakers. And thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.